Welcome to the OHSU Effect Inside Health and Science. I'm Lacey Evans. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about family planning and contraception. According to the CDC, half of all pregnancies are unintended. And while the majority of women are using birth control, 7% of women who are the most at risk for unintended pregnancies are not using contraception. With me now on KXL is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, a Leon Spiroff professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at OHSU. Good morning. Good morning, Lizzie. Okay, so many people may think that current birth control methods are effective, but you say that's not always the case, right? Well, current birth control methods are highly effective, but there are two characteristics of use that are very important. One we refer to as method failure. That's how well a method will be when we use it perfectly, and that would be perhaps like the EPA estimate for driving a car. Uh, What we typically see, though, is the user failure, and we call that typical use failure. Now, for a birth control pill, for instance, the method failure is about 1%, but in typical use, we see failures of 8 to 11%, and that's a shocking difference. So just people, women forgetting to take the pill, things like that? It's not just women forgetting to take the pill. It's everybody forgetting to take pills. Medicines are hard to take. And to take a daily medication for a non-chronic disease uh, for which the benefit is very, very separate from the opportunity to use the medication is extraordinarily difficult. And that's one of the great challenges. Now, look back, though, and remember that 50 years ago, when birth control pills were first introduced, there were no other highly effective options for women. Women were highly motivated to avoid unintended pregnancy. So the opportunity to have a highly effective method of contraception was extremely important uh, for women, and it's really made society what it is today. But we can do better. Well, how can birth control be improved? Well, one of the areas of real interest now is the use of long-acting reversible methods, and we actually have an acronym for this LARC, or LARC methods. This is not a LARC, uh, but it's actually a strategy towards reducing failure by giving women the tools to avoid pregnancy in a way that does not require them to remember to do something every day. In this way, we link method failure and typical failure. So there are, uh, is no difference, uh, and we are able to bring everyone closer to perfect use. Give me some examples of no. that type of birth control. Well, one of the more popular methods uh, that are, have emerged, or reemerged, I should say, would be intrauterine contraception. And we have two highly effective IUDs on the U.S. market. One's a copper-containing device, and the other device contains a small amount of the common contraceptive hormone levonorgestrel. Both of these methods have failures of under 1%. uh, And while the characteristics of use are somewhat different between the two devices, they're very highly effective options, one hormonal and one non-hormonal. Are there safety concerns here with any of these methods? Well, we have to always balance safety with uh, benefit when we talk about contraception. The good news is all of our methods of contraception are highly safe, highly effective, and far less risky than the alternative for most women, which is pregnancy. You know, we often fail to understand that pregnancy carries substantial risks and is the number one uh, around the world leading cause of death for women in the reproductive years. Let's talk about some misconceptions that maybe birth control users think, like weight gain. Is that true that women uh, will gain weight if they take the pill or something? Well, in our society, it seems that women will gain weight whether or not they take the pill. (laughs) Uh, When we look overall, we see a growing problem with obesity in the United States, and it seems to be linked to many aspects of our environment, particularly the availability of lots of high-fat, good-tasting food. Uh, A colleague of mine, Dr. Allison Edelman, recently completed some studies at the Oregon Primate Center using a monkey model. In these studies, she actually gave oral contraceptives to monkeys that were both lean and obese uh, and followed their weight over several months on a controlled diet. Uh, Surprisingly, she found that both groups lost weight, but the group that lost the most weight was the obese monkeys. Therefore, we might consider birth control pills to be a good strategy for a weight loss diet. (laughs) Any other myths that you want to clear up or misconceptions that the public has? Another myth is that intrauterine contraception is not safe or particularly not safe for young women. Uh, What we see is that IUDs are highly effective and their characteristics of not being needed to be remembered every day are really ideal, particularly for very young women. 
independent studies have shown that IUDs are not a risk factor for pelvic infections, and they are not a risk factor for infertility. Furthermore, the mechanism of action of IUDs is that they prevent fertilization. Now, many people believe that IUDs uh, prevent a pregnancy from implanting, and that's not a primary mechanism of action. In fact, detailed studies have shown that IUDs prevent fertilizations, and when fertilizations occur, we tend to see failures, and that's why these devices have a small but measurable failure rate. Well, tell us more about the research that you're doing. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> Here in Oregon, we're very, very fortunate uh, that we actually have uh, one of the leading contraception research programs in the country. We're funded by the National Institute of Health as a clinical trial center for contraception, and we do a number of cutting-edge early clinical trials uh, on new birth control methods. Uh, for instance, right now at the OHSU Center for Women's Health, Women's Health Research Unit, 503-494-3666. We're enrolling women in clinical trials of a new birth control injection, a new non-estrogen containing birth control patch, uh, and we're leading the way to begin new studies looking at a novel long-acting vaginal ring method. While all these methods are hormonal, uh, there are other options on the way. Uh, I participate in a group of scientists at the Oregon Primate Research Center that is funded by the NIH as a contraceptive development research center. Uh, this group is exploring novel and non-hormonal methods for contraception that involve mechanisms that prevent the egg cell from maturing so it cannot be fertilized. Uh, this happens without any impact on menstrual cycles. We're also looking at novel pathways that interfere with movement of the egg and sperm in the reproductive tract uh, and novel factors that can prevent the ovary from releasing an egg so it cannot be fertilized. These are very, very exciting next-generation contraceptives. Our group is also investigating a novel non-surgical method of permanent contraception, female sterilization, that would be as easy to use as placing an IUD and would be safe for women both in the developed world but also an inexpensive uh, solution for women in uh, less developed regions of the world where the per capita health care expenditures are very, very low. So we're very excited about the groundbreaking work that we're doing right now here in Oregon. It sounds exciting. And you're also going to be giving the Markham Hill Lecture on the 16th. What will you address at that talk? Well, one of my main areas of interest, Lacey, has been the interaction between population and the environment. And it's one of the key motivators that I have for my work. Uh, what we see is that the world population passed 7 billion on October 31 of 2011. And this is a real landmark. Uh, we hit 6 billion in 1999. Uh, now, if you look back, world population didn't reach 1 billion until 1807, 2 billion around 1927. Uh, we were at 4 billion people in 1974. So the uh, world uh, of opportunity, the Ayn Rand world perhaps, uh, was a world of a population of under 3 billion people. We're far beyond that, and that is limiting the opportunities for people around the world. Uh, now, family planning uh, becomes an opportunity. Uh, one, it gives women the opportunity to participate equally in all aspects of life, and I think that this is something uh, that as we increase access both here in the develop and in the developing world, we're going to make a better world, because when women are involved in things, they make the world a better place for communities uh, and families and for all of us. Well, I want to ask you just one more thing. When choosing a birth control method, what should women consider? Well, I think that the important things to consider are how effective the method is uh, and how that will fit into a woman's lifestyle. Uh, additionally, there are certain methods that have particular health benefits. For instance, uh, reduction in the amount of menstrual bleeding. Uh, other methods can reduce uh, common problems such as acne. Uh, so I think that women should shop around and ask their doctors not only what will this method do as far as preventing pregnancy, but what other health benefits might I acquire from it? Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, the Leon Spiroff Professor and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at OHSU. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lacey. And again, Dr. Jensen is giving the Markham Hill Lecture on February 16th. It starts at 730 in the OHSU Auditorium, and it is free and everyone is welcome. We have more of the OHSU Effect coming up in five minutes here on FM News 101.